Thank you for coming to our most recent NASA at Google Talk. Today we have uh, Paramal PK, as he's known casually, um, to talk about drones. Paramal is the manager of the Safe Operations Autonomous System Systems <laughs> Unit at Ames. He's been there for about 13 years, and he holds degrees in both industrial and production engineering. Is that correct? Yeah. Great. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to give the stage over to PK. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for inviting me. This is a great uh, privilege to be here. Uh, I had a wonderful Google lunch that everybody talks about, so that was nice. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about how we can enable, safely enable large-scale U.S. operations in the low-altitude airspace. As you know, there is a lot of excitement uh, going on in the drone industry, and I know Google and many other companies are working on uh, basically drones and drone applications. And our goal is to try to enable the entire industry in a safe manner. So let's, uh, before we start to look at the future of aviation, let's look at the current aviation system and how the aircraft operate in the national airspace system, what we refer to as NAS. This animation displays air traffic over the United States. It was created using real air traffic data from the Federal Aviation Administration. The animation starts at 8 p.m. and ends at 8 p.m. Eastern Time the following day. Late in the evening, a rush of flights can be seen departing for European destinations. Quite a few aircraft are still seen flying between the West Coast airports. In the middle of the night, the skies are clear and the number of aircraft drops below 900. Notice the red-eye transcontinental flights headed to the East Coast. Around 5 a.m., flights are seen departing from Memphis, a hub for FedEx. As the day dawns, traffic starts to build up on the East Coast. At 8 a.m., half of the country is bubbling with traffic while the other half is still sleeping. Flights are seen moving westward, and the airspace gets populated with aircraft across the country as the day progresses. Around 11 a.m., a steady stream of arrivals is seen coming across the Atlantic Ocean. The various airline hubs can be seen throughout the day. A hub can be identified by the density of aircraft around it. The two holes seen in the triangle between San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake City are military operation areas and civilian aircraft are forbidden to fly through them. In the middle of the day, the number of aircraft peak just over 5,000. The animation shows the congested northeastern part of the United States and the complexity of the air traffic management problem. This animation displays air traffic and weather over the northeastern part of the United States. In the beginning, the flow is smooth, but when severe weather strikes around 9.30 a.m., the airports can't handle the arrivals. Many aircraft are seen holding in the air, shown by the racetrack patterns of blue lines which represent trails of aircraft arriving at four New York area airports. Several aircraft are seen deviating around severe weather and flying through gaps between storm systems. Many aircraft, usually flying along the East Coast, were directed to fly over the Atlantic Ocean to reach their New York area destinations. On this day of significant delays, weather impacted arrival traffic for more than seven hours. Weather is the main cause of all delays of air traffic in the United States. So let's talk about the two animation. The first animation actually shows the complexity in the national airspace system as it exists today. There are 50,000 operations in a day, about 5,000 at a peak time. Um, if you postulate a future with drones operating, that those numbers that you just saw will compare really, really small with, as compared with what we are expecting to happen in the future. So we really need some way to organize this traffic. The second animation that showed us that the complexity increases as soon as the weather actually uh, happens to come in the national airspace system. So as soon as we experience the weather, we have tremendous delays and lots of impact in the airspace system. Now, if we start to look at the future, for those who have uh, gone to India and other places or have seen these pictures from the past, 
can postulate and relate to this, that when you start to have number of new entrants on the road, all of a sudden you realize that you need some way to organize them because the complexity has gone up and you have different entrants and different types of operations happening and, the, and without some kind of organization, you're gonna have a trade-off between efficiency and safety. So all, all of a sudden you realize that let's, let's make sure that we have some way to organize this traffic. What happened in 1956 is two aircraft collided over Grand Canyon and that started the air transportation system and air traffic management system. 1958 when FAA was born at the same time NASA was born. So what we are trying to do is get ahead of that and come up with the system that will allow us to enable, safely enable large scale drone operations at the low altitude. Currently the low altitude airspace, typically called class G airspace is regulated but not controlled. So as soon as you start to pump in lots of drones and other uh, vehicles there, we would like to see that they basically operate harmoniously with each other, helicopters, uh, personal aircraft vehicles, as well as drones. How do we do that? So our near-term goal is to basically safely enable these operations as soon as possible, and the long-term goal is to accommodate the complexity and the increased, basically, capacity that is expected to happen in that airspace. There are lots of applications of drones that have been postulated. Of course, surveillance of key assets like railroad and pipelines, search and rescue, cargo delivery, UAV helping ambulance, taking pictures, recreational activities and such. So once you realize that there are a number of these operations going to happen at the same time, same place in the same airspace, uh, then we really say that let's make sure that we have some way to organize them. So that's basically calling for a persistent system at an airspace and a geographical area, as well as you look at the portable system where you go from one basically area to another air, area, such as uh, disaster relief applications or agriculture applications where they are very confined to, to that geographical area or airspace. So we are talking about two different types of applications. Nonetheless, the characteristics of enabling them safely and harmoniously are the same. In terms of US traffic manage management, we are really trying to balance three goals. First goal is national and regional security. We want to make sure that the drones either accidentally don't go where they shouldn't go, uh, such as uh, uh, White House and Wall Street and, and number of key assets on the ground, as well as we don't have rogue operators that basically go and create damage intentionally. So we have to worry about the national and regional security. At the same time, we're trying to make sure that we get economic value of using the low altitude, using the drone applications. And there are a number of these applications, commercial applications, uh, as you saw, agriculture applications, as well as personal applications. My personal, my personal dream is that every home will have a drone and every home will serve as an aerodrome sometime in the future. So how do we enable that? That needs to be enabled through safe airspace integration. So the idea is to create flexible, digital, virtual infrastructure. So flexibility where possible and structure where it's necessary is one mantra. And second is you match the geographical needs, applications with the performance that's required to operate in that airspace. So let's take each one of them. So flexibility where possible. So the idea is that you can go wherever you want to go till the point where the demand and capacity are off balance then you may need some structures such as corridors, crossing restrictions, or altitude for direction. So it's completely based on the demand and the capacity. The second mantra here is the need of the geography as well as application. So here the context is that if you are operating in the remote areas and your application is you're doing surveillance, you're never going to get down to the ground, then the required performance on the airspace operations, on the vehicle as well as airspace, is different than you're going to operate in the congested airspace as well as near urban airspace and going all the way to the down, all the way to the ground, to the last and first 50 feet. So the performance characteristics on the vehicle and the type of capability you need on the vehicle is different. So we want to match the geography, the risks involved with that, as well as the application with the required performance to operate in that airspace. 
So what is UTM? This question always comes. What is UTM? UTM sort of is a research prototype, and ideally we, what we are after is developing the airspace operations performance requirements through this research prototype, which will allow the operators to basically submit flight plans, tons of flight plans at the same time, and execute their missions at the low altitude operations. You will also check to make sure that there are no constraints. They're not violating any constraints, and we'll talk about what those look like. At the same time, we envision that these basically system will consist of multiple airspace providers, just like internet service providers, ISPs. You could have multiple airspace service providers that could interoperate harmoniously in the same airspace. So let's look at the functions of UTM. The first fun function is airspace operations and management. So what is the boundary of the low altitude? So currently we envision 500 feet and below. Obviously that's uh, dependent on the type of operations you want to conduct, the types of missions, as well as the density. So you might want to change that, uh, but nonetheless, at the moment, we are envisioning that 500 feet and below. There's no reason to climb to spend energy if you don't have to. And again, going back to the point we made before, that geographical needs and applications will have to be coupled together. So the rules for airspace will be based on the performance and the geography that's associated with that operation. So this picture shows geofences. So there are two types of geofences. One is a static geofence, such as basically White House, or in this case, it shows a stadium and a dynamic geofence, such as wildfire affected area, which moves over time. So that geofence changes over time. So you need to have constant update, updated information about the geofences which one the areas which are sort of no-fly zones or the airspace to avoid. The second function of UTM service would be the wind and weather integration. So the idea here is that the current vehicles that operate in that air, this airspace are largely helicopters and gliders. They have a different susceptibility to winds than the 55-pound vehicle that is going to operate here. So we really need a lot finer grid and more accurate forecast of the wind so that we can actually show and make that information available to all the users to say which airspace is uh, safe to fly and which is not. Then congestion management. As soon as we allow these operations, we expect that demand and capacity could get off balance in certain locations. And once that happens, then we need to have ways to manage that. So obviously, this is only needed type of basically feature that it will create corridors or altitude for direction and any crossing restrictions based on the demand and capacity imbalance. The, another feature of uh, this UTM is separation management. Ideally, you want all the separation and collision management to occur on the vehicle side. Till the point where we have vehicles that get smart and can do its own sense and avoid there is no reason necessarily to stop these operations. We can initiate these operations with a number of different constructs. First construct is airspace reservation. So you can actually file a trajectory or flight plan and say, okay, this airspace is mine, and you complete your use case or mission, and then that airspace gets open. You can actually notify to the other operators that I am operating in this airspace. I, uh, in the future, obviously, as the density goes up, that is highly inefficient. So we want to see some kind of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle sense and avoid and separation management collision avoidance technologies. And that could happen through sensors on board as well as connected systems through internet and what we call as V2V and V2UTM systems, much like autonomous cars. One of the underpinnings of that is tracking. In the very remote areas over water, you may not need any tracking because their density is very low. You let them fly wherever they want to fly, uh, and they close the, uh, the trajectory once their operation is finished. But as you get closer to the congested airspace, highly constrained airspace, closer to the geofence areas, you want to have sophisticated tracking. There are a number of options. Cell phone-based tracking, ADSB tracking, ADSB-based tracking as satellite, Q-band, KU-band tracking. So, Let's take one, uh, 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 each option at a time. The cell phone based tracking, which is very promising, but currently only roughly 55% of the land is covered by cell phones. 
So what do we do about the rest? ADSB, automatic dependent surveillance based broadcast tracking is also postulated, which also shows promise. However, it has its own uh, limitations. Then the question is, what is the best way, most persistent tracking mechanism? So some places you may need combination of the three cell phone satellite based as well as ADSB based tracking to make sure that we know exactly where the vehicles are. So the idea there is to make sure that they do not cross geofences where they shouldn't go. And uh, another feature of the UTM is contingency management. Obviously, we, the cost of entry into airspace is gone to zero with these drones, which is really exciting because you see lots of good applications. However, it also poses some challenges, such as 911. It's possible, conceivable that situations like 911 could be uh, could happen with drones. So how do we actually tackle that? So you really need to know that which are the cooperative targets and which are non-cooperative targets. So you may need a surveillance system around high value assets. We are also interested in making sure that the large scale GPS as well as cell phone outage uh, happens. And if that happens, how do you actually manage that? So vehicle, onboard vehicles will have certain capabilities simultaneous localization and mapping, and then some kind of basically recovery path and contingencies that says if you lose everything, then you have to abort your basically trajectory and land in a safe place. This cartoon actually gives sort of an idea what are the different steps involved in submitting the flight plan, then checking through the UTM type of services, uh, and these are, by the way, not monolithic services. So you, number of operators can have their own UTM type of services, and they can connect with each other. Uh, so operator will submit the, the, the flight plan or trajectory. It can be a scheduled one, or it can be on demand. Then it would, the system will check for authentication, make sure that the vehicle and the operator is authenticated. Then it will check for all the constraints. It will check for static as well as dynamic constraints. We'll make sure that there are no contingencies. It's, uh, it's going through the right airspace and it's not crossing any geofences and such. And then, operation, as the operation is completed, it will end the mission and the airspace will get open. Then we have four technical capabilities. The way we envision going about doing this. So it's missing this, which is interesting, but. Uh, nonetheless, we finished that capability, so it's less important. <laughs> we finished that demonstration. So we have, the way we go about doing this is follow crawl, walk, run strategy. So the idea is each capability targets uh, different types of application, geographical area, and, and the risk associated with that. So the first capability, which we demonstrated uh, in August uh, this year, last year, uh, included airspace reservation as the basic construct. So you have trajectory planner, you can file the trajectory, it will check for all the constraints, and that airspace is yours till you close that trajectory. And it uses either airspace notification or airspace reservation as the construct to notify the other operators where you are operating. But that was focused on within visual line of sight. So the next capability, and the first capability really targets remote areas, very low density operations over water and such. Uh, precision agriculture or things like that that operate in a very remote areas will be supported by this capability. The second capability goes, allows us to go beyond visual line of sight. It also offers tracking of these vehicles through either cell phone, ADSB, or satellite based KU band. Uh, and again, supports low density operations, sparsely populated areas, and there will be some basic rules when there are a number of vehicles operating at the same time in the same uh, airspace. Uh, this will enable the longer range applications because it is going beyond visual line of sight. The third capability adds a separation management component to that, which allows vehicle to vehicle or, or vehicle through UTM connected systems, through either through internet or some other means, uh, which allows to have some basic interaction with the manned air vehicles as well as unmanned systems. So as I mentioned before, this is an airspace where you see some helicopter operations. So, so it's very critical that we have a system that allows operators to keep away from each other. Fundamentally, we are after five basic principles. 
The first principle is drones don't hit each other. Second principle is drones and manned aviation stay uh, away from each other. Third one is drone operator has complete awareness of all the constraints and avoids all the constraints in the airspace. Fourth principle is drone, all the drone operator as well as the drones themselves are authenticated. And the fifth principle is drone operators and drones basically give preference to uh, public safety drones and public safety manned aviate, aviation. So th using those principles, then we go to the basically the subsequent capabilities. And the last capability, which is the fourth capability that allows you to operate in the urban high density airspace where you really need to worry about large scale contingencies that we talked about before. But this is where our vision is. This is where everybody wants to go, to be able to go to the fourth capability and allow lots of uses of drones in the urban airspace. Now, the elegance of this approach is that it is not monolithic system that you have to actually apply the entire system everywhere. This is the way we have organized this is research prototype is in a, uh, using cloud-based services. So multiple providers could basically offer different services. You could have multiple operators, will pro just like I mentioned before, internet service providers, you could have airspace service, services providers, and they could connect with each other through a common application protocol interface. So multiple providers could offer similar services. There could be some tailoring of operational services based on geographical area. This picture basically shows that if you are in a, <clears throat> a remote area or less congested airspace, you could get away with the build one or technical capability level one type of services. And if you are in a very uh, congested urban airspace, you may need higher levels of technical capabilities and requirements on the vehicle as well as airspace operations. So that shows U4, which is UTM4 class of kind of airspace. So the elegance, again, is to try to make sure that the, you balance the services that are needed based on the airspace where you want to operate, the risks on the ground, as well as the use case that you're after. And the vehicle performance and vehicle characteristics needed across these four technical capabilities is different. Now the question comes, who operates this airspace and what's the right business model? Now, different countries, we have been uh, in discussion with many countries about how they think this will evolve in each location. And different countries have different ways of organizing the businesses around this UTM construct. So it could be a single service provider, like a government entity, traditional air, airspace navigation services that could provide this service, or it could be multiple service providers at the local, state, or county levels uh, that could operate this. Or it could be a single service provider, but a non-government entity. Or it could be multiple service providers, uh, basically s providing services through non-government entities. So you can customize and figure out how we can interoperate with uh, each other. So that's sort of the basic idea of these different business models, and as I mentioned, the different countries are actually looking at different types of business models and fee-for-service kind of characterization. Regardless, the regulator will have a key role in certifying the system and operations, and all, all UTM systems or their variations will interact with each other. So what are the key technologies then? You know, the question always comes, what's missing? What are the barriers? What are the key technologies we still need to have? Now, these are 55 pound and below type of vehicles. So their ability to carry size, weight, power is, is somewhat limited. So we really need to make sure that, uh, that, that anything that you put on the vehicle can sustain in terms of size, weight, power, and the cost. So first, uh, capability, new technology, key technology is uh, track and locate. And it could be a combination of the things that I, we discussed, cell phone, ADSB, satellite-based technologies, you know, very small, basically, that can fit on, on the smaller vehicle and carry, and the payload is small, the power is, uh, requirement is small, but persistently uh, track, will be able to track the vehicles and their location. Sense and avoid. This is an interesting problem. So. 
uh, as you see sensor and wire technology is evolving everywhere, the ability to carry the sensor packs on these vehicles is highly limited, which actually offers a lot of innovative approaches, uh, LiDAR-based and vision-based systems that actually have been tried. Uh, one of the key challenges is to small objects, such as these wires. To be able to see these wires from farther distance and to be able to basically stay away from them is one of the key challenges in the sensor and wire technologies because these vehicles are operating at the lower altitude. Last and first 50 feet operation, autonomous operations is another interesting challenge. So what happens is you ideally you want these vehicles to operate completely autonomously all the way to the doorstep. Then the question comes, how are you going to tackle the problem where grandma is doing landscaping, kids are running around with soccer ball, and um, there are pets running around. So you need highly intelligent system on the vehicle itself that senses any obstacles along the way and basically figures out what to do with it. There are a number of other approaches which are not necessarily technical. You could have a, a thread that drops the basically Whatever package you are doing uh, or delivering is one way. You could have a chimney that's raised. You could have your mailbox raised by 10 feet. But nonetheless, in the future, we would like to see the last and first 50 feet operation happening fully autonomously. Weather sensing and prediction is another interesting area where you need a lot more refined weather sensing and prediction, particularly the wind in this airspace, so that the the vehicle itself can actually take, a, take advantage of the information and figure out what's the right path, what's the right optimal path for that particular use case and avoid the areas that they should avoid. And as I mentioned before, we see this as a, one of the potential here is that multiple service providers could actually offer services for the operator. So then the idea is to integrate them through some common application protocol interface. In terms of progress, what we have done so far uh, is that we have completed technical capability level one. We did demonstration with uh, 12 partners, and uh, we have successfully shown that the basic construct of airspace notification and reservation is, it could be adequate for remote kind of areas uh, through the research. Our next step is to basically continue to evolve this prototype. So we have been working with uh, very closely with FAA, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, Department of Interior. We have something we refer to as research transition team that collaborates across the government entities. We also have very tight co coordination and collaboration across industry and academic circles. We have over 125 collaborators uh, from industry as well as academia. Uh, we developed the initial concept of operations. We demonstrated that we got a lot of feedback from lots of stakeholders, and we continue to evolve this. There has been many, many uh, basically discussions and, and uh, simulations as well as testing of these constructs. Uh, we also released our uh, application protocol interface, so anybody who wants to collaborate with us gets an application protocol interface that allows them to connect their subsystems as well as the vehicle operations. Uh, as I mentioned, technical capability level one tests were successfully completed, and we have a huge international interest. Uh, we just got uh, over six uh, international entities that are really interested in following the construct of UTM across different countries and figuring out how they can benefit from using the construct UTM. Our next steps uh, basically will continue to evolve this construct of UTM, particularly in, uh, going towards high density urban airspace. Uh, we want to conduct, develop, uh, conduct and uh, more research on the sensors that, that we really need, as small, as small as we can get, continue simulations and test these builds along the way. We will also continue to work with industry and other academy and government groups to refine the concepts and our system architectures. There are different ways of organizing the data structures as well as inter interacting with multiple operators. We have a prototype, then we will continue to evolve with that till we, we are able to prove that safe um, integration uh, could occur everywhere. We also have a national uh, initial campaign uh, focused on 
creating the UTM kind of structures at the FAA test sites and allowing them to do further validation of the data. And I would like to show you uh, an animation of how this, this system could uh, work. shows the geofence areas and how it will avoid the geofence areas. Any questions? How do you think a terrorist attack employing drones would uh, impact development of uh, UTM and drone utilization in general? Well, obviously, uh, any any terrorist attack is attack is bad, and it does set us back uh, and and causes uh, pause, uh, like nine one one. But but I think there is uh, that there are two uh, two answers to that. One is that. We shouldn't stop progress, so innovation will continue to occur to avoid that. And second is there are technologies already uh, in, in being developed that will detect uncooperative targets and then figure out what to do with them. But that's in the law and order kind of situation. So the idea here in the UTM is to figure out uh, the uh, rogue operators or uncooperative objects that are basically trespassing into geofence, and that's where UTM stops, but there are a number of technologies and sensors and ra low altitude radars that you may have to have at certain locations, key assets on the ground. But it could it could set us back, uh, but at the same time, uh, this is the time to actually think through and figure out what systems we need to be, uh, we need to put in place to, to avoid or prevent or basically manage that kind of situation. I'm kind of curious. I was just listening to a podcast on private plane and drone um, private companies that are doing surveillance, and a lot of the problems they were coming up against were um, just public opinion and people like uh, in cities voting down wanting to have that around them. So just curious what efforts you guys have going in that direction. Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And we, we collaborate on with many 
entities on number of things and so the one of the of the, the basically our thrust is technical airspace operations performance requirements so developing that a set of requirements is what we are after. Obviously, we understand the, the barriers are uh, this lack of these technical requirements. Second is uh, privacy considerations, security considerations as the previous uh, question, uh, public acceptance and policies. Uh, we at NASA uh, are not, we are not working on that particular problem, but we are collaborating with a number of other entities, uh, federal as well as non-federal entities to figure out what is the right way to do that. Uh, in your slide with uh, business models, you kind of had uh, different quadrants of one, one service provider to rule them all and then a federated system. Um, in your discussions, in particular, I'm interested in international discussions. Are the people falling into that quadrant somewhere where they're comfortable? Yeah, I think uh, uh, there are certain countries who, are, uh, who have privatized operations already, airspace management, ATM. Uh, so they they have a preference for different quadrant than uh, some other uh, countries. So I think really what they are familiar with, what their safety record is, what their density of operations and complexity is, uh, will make them comfortable. So different actually quadrants appeal to different countries based on that and then the amount of investment that's needed. So that's a great question, but uh, it's it's fortunately. One size fits all is not what we are after. We are basically allowing the cloud-based architecture to, to go in any direction, any quadrant that a uh, country wants to go. The system is, should be flexible enough to offer any of these services. Uh, we've seen a lot of innovation in UAV over the last few years. Where do you uh, see hobbyists and startups falling, not just as aviators, but as ones developing control systems and vehicles? So yeah, I think it's been great. Trend? You know, yeah. No, I, I, I thank you. Uh, I think it's been great. I mean, because of the the number of uh, innovators that have entered into this traditional as well as non-traditional com aviation companies, we have seen a, a very rapid development towards sense and avoid technologies, tracking and locating things, and uh, as well as. Uh, assured autonomy for last and first 50 feet. We haven't solved all the problems, but I think we are, because of the collaboration we have with number of uh, entities uh, and the interest that uh, that exists and the funding that's gone into this is unprecedented, I think. you know. So I see this as a great sign for aviation. It's, it's really exciting to be aviator again, you know. Do we expect to see carve-outs in the airspace for people to develop these new systems, or will they have to polish it you know, indoors before it can be released into the wider airspace? Do you? See, what was the first sentence? Do you see what? Uh, a carve-out in the airspace for people who are developing new vehicles and new control systems for vehicles. Oh, yeah. I think there is a lot. Already there are a number of companies that are developing new systems for... Some of them are developing operating system for autonomous systems. Some of their control, new control systems. So I, I see a lot of opportunity. Yeah. And if you have ideas, we obviously would like to work with you. So uh, coming at it from a position of being a private pilot, I'm uh, curious uh, your take on how much of getting this right depends on placing restrictions that don't exist today on aircraft, on on current aircraft, like. The, there's no reason, for instance, that other than not having a commercial license that I can't go fly a crop duster at a couple hundred feet off the ground at very high speeds, uh, and then you clear a UAV to fly through my field, uh, because all of that is unregulated right now, uh, and the same for helicopters and sightseeing flights and other things. So given that we don't file these detailed flight plans and get reserved airspace uh, for all of those sorts of operations, how do we fit UAVs into all of that? You no, know, that's a great question, right? So. Uh, and there are probably different answers depending on location and the density. Currently, the airspace is regulated but not controlled, the Class G airspace where general aviation largely occurs. And yeah, they are not required to file flight plan or trajectories, but some of them do. So one option is that you have uh, basically uh, the drone operators file trajectories and through network system, everybody has access to that information. So even before you take off, as a general aviator, you have you know information as to where the drones are likely to 
operate. You know, uh, other one is basically very tactical, where both have some kind of way to coordinate with each other, V2V systems that are evolving now, and keep away from each other. Right. So it really a uh, function of density and what kind of uh, risks we want to mitigate. If there's a huge amount of drone operations going on, same airspace, obviously you would like to know that and vice versa. So, but um, to the to the same effect, if if that would basically mean that in order to avoid hitting drones, you would either by regulation or by uh, <laughs> um, preservation of life need to get additional equipment for your aircraft. Right. So the, I think. Technology first, you know, is, is my bias. I will try to figure out sure. if we can solve this problem uh, through technology. You know, obviously there is always a regulatory aspect, uh, and and that's something that FAA has to, um, I mean, you know, think deep. But uh, if we can come up with this, is where the innovation. The prior question, where is the innovation? This is where one of the possibilities where we could actually collaboratively innovate something that will actually help the entire aviation industry. So the schedule for rolling out, uh, you had a slide, the first one was empty, and then you had three more. Uh, it's a fairly aggressive schedule. Um, and you mentioned some, <clears throat> some technologies that were going to be potentially used, like SLAM, which is a very um, early, um, very challenging uh, yeah. type of technology to use. So how do you feel that the pace of, of technology and um, like processing power and battery and all those things uh, is going to look in the next five years compared to the types of regulation that we'd like to be able to enforce? Yeah, so the, the schedule that you saw, um, I should clarify that that's not a rollout schedule for operations. That's where we would like to do the test to understand the requirements to operate in the, the rollout schedule, obviously, is not up to NASA. It's really about making sure that we have all the other issues, you know, as previous um, person asked about privacy and public policy, and then making sure that uh, FIA has a regulatory structure in place. So a rollout schedule will depend on a lot of other factors than what we showed. But the SLAM, going back to your question about the SLAM technology, I think uh, we are hoping that in four years, we are working on some uh, aggressively as well as you guys and many others on Sense and Award and, and SLAM technology. So we are hoping that by 2019, we will have a reasonable prototype technology. So that's sort of our goal, is to try to push ourselves to get to that point. Um, is there a risk in that? Yeah, it's possible that we may not get completely 100% accurate by then. But I think the goal, current indicators are that we are migrating towards that. So, And anyhow, if you have thoughts on particular risks in the technologies or things that we should be looking at, obviously we are open to that. Uh, at the moment, we, we're already seeing a proliferation of radio technologies with uh, general aviation, like you have your UAT transmitters and the you know, 1090 band. Um, do we expect um, UAVs and drones to have um, multiple radio technologies to communicate? Or you know, will we just rely on a central point to coordinate? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are, uh, we are exploring a number of uh, aviation grade as well as currently non-aviation approved technologies, like cell phone based technologies. So um, you, what you mentioned about ADS-B and UAT, 1090 and, and, and UAT technologies of frequencies are possible. They are one candidates, but then there could be cell phone based possibilities. So we are exploring that as well. Uh, we, don't, the, the, we don't know exactly how this will evolve, whether it will consist of multi, multiple technologies for the same platform, based on their altitude or location or well may evolve differently thank you so much